So uh, thank you very much, uh, Stanford. Thank you, Mark. This is a tremendous day, and uh, congratulations for all the efforts uh, you've been involved with the last uh, few years. And uh, in, in, in a way, my talk is a continuation of uh, what you talked about this morning and what your dean uh, talked about as well. Uh, it may seem to you that my outline is a discombobulated uh, uh, sort of a mishmash of topics, but believe me, there is sort of a method to my madness. I'd like to uh, sort of peel the onion a little bit slowly. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I do not differentiate between public health and population health. The health of populations is called the health of the public. So sometimes people equate public health with public health departments or at the state and, uh, and um, uh, local level. Uh, it's population health. So public health sciences is population health sciences. So I want to take you with me on a little journey. Hopefully there will be some uh, time for Q&A. If not, uh, we, I can talk to people in the hallways. Um, I've been kind of blessed over the last 30 years to work in uh, at the federal level at both CDC and the last 10 years at NIH. And I've been trying to join the, uh, the world of upstream science with downstream sort of public health applications and population health applications. A little bit of intro on the excitement about precision medicine. We'll go through this very fast since your dean already talked about that. I want to talk a bit about the challenges about big data uh, and the concept of causation as we move forward. Uh, because that's key to a lot of the things we might or might not be able to do with big data. Then I'll talk briefly about the four principles of public health approaches to realizing the promise of precision medicine, and then uh, move on from precision medicine or precision health, as your dean talks about it, to precision population health or precision public health. So bear with me. So earlier this year, you've heard the story there is a precision medicine initiative going on in the country. Hopefully, there will be some funding uh, if Congress can get its act together. Uh, but it has two components, essentially the, uh, uh, the uh, cancer component, which is focused most, mostly on or totally on the therapeutic aspects of this uh, genomically driven, uh, molecularly driven uh, treatments, precision, and the idea of a national cohort that uh, uh, has been discussed, and uh, it's sort of a the proposed notion of a million plus people who would be followed up uh, for years to uh, try to understand better the causes of human disease across uh, the spectrum from cancer to other uh, common chronic diseases with the idea of developing better prevention and therapeutic targets. Uh, needless to say, those of us who live in the world of public health had mixed feelings about the Precision Medicine Initiative because many of us viewed this as a sort of a taking away from the resources that are needed to tackle sort of larger social determinants of health or ecological determinants of health. These are two uh, papers in prominent journals. Uh, Sandra Galea from New York has uh, or, uh, sort of uh, taken on the, the notion. And I, I wrote a letter to the editor uh, uh, and I shared it with Sandra. The New England did not accept it, but I ended up publishing it as a blog. I think it's a wrong uh, fight to fight. We are not fighting precision medicine versus public health. I think it's one and the same. But let me unfold that story to you a little bit more uh, slowly. Uh, what prompted me to write this piece, which was published uh, in JAMA earlier this year and at the end of May, is when Francis Collins came up in the uh, early, one of the many workshops that NIH sponsored and talked about what would early success look like because we're spending millions of dollars to follow million plus people. And so that it doesn't look like there is an end in sight. There is no hypothesis driven uh, enterprise here. It's just collecting data on large numbers of people. And uh, the way he used that example is sort of a hypothetical 50 year old woman with suboptimal diabetes control. And based on her sequence and implanted chip and smartphone and all that good stuff and technology, within five years that uh, there will be a new drug that would, uh, uh, based on molec enhanced molecular understanding of diabetes, that would adjust the dose to the genotype. And I was scratching my head because uh, I know, I mean, this is, uh, and said this is all can be done in five years. I, 
uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here, but so I, I wrote my own piece. What is early success? I mean, if you have a million people, and I just took the idea of diabetes, and in a million people, there are tens of thousands and maybe more than a hundred thousand of people with pre-diabetes, people who are at risk of diabetes and may or may not know they have it, may or may not be found. So can't we just find these people? That's precision population health and refer them to the, you know, the treatments that they're supposed to do, you know, the, the physical activities and maybe plus or minus oral hypoglycemics, even with not a single new discovery. There is no new discovery. We know what to do. There is a spectrum of, of things from pre-diabetes to diabetes. So it takes us away from the focus on treatment to the focus on prevention and the, the need of uh, you know, sort of controlling the diabetes problem by using the, the tools of smartphones and what, whatever uh, that, uh, that are our disposal for uh, uh, finding out a million cohort uh, people. So I, I'm going to use more examples on the genetic side. So having worked at CDC for so long, when uh, Tom Frieden became the CDC director uh, back in 2010, he published this American Journal of Public Health piece, which I want to take you through it, that there are uh, things that we do to improve health of populations. He called it the health impact pyramid. At the, where the most impact that we can accomplish is at the bottom of the pyramid. So by changing the uh, socioeconomic factors, working on poverty, education, housing, and jobs, et cetera, we're going to improve health. This has nothing to do with either precision medicine or precision uh, health or precision population health. The second thing we can do is changing the context, what he calls it. These are policy interventions like fluoridation, uh, smoke-free laws, things that are not personalized but mostly one size fits all that uh, changing the policy at the population level may actually help uh, the health of millions of people. And then there are these, what he calls these long-lasting protective interventions like immunizations, colonoscopies, et cetera, uh, that may uh, prevent disease on the long run. And then he puts clinical interventions somewhere up here with sort of treatment. So treatment works on a slice of the public health pie because this is the individualized part of uh, medicine. I mean, and by the way, all medicine should be personalized. And I think uh, precision medicine is just the recent sort of uh, maybe the craze word that we use, but uh, we have more tools to make medicine work better. So, I mean, whether we use the word uh, precision or not. And at the top of the pyramid is the so-called counseling and education. And I, I think you can tell uh, Tom Frieden's bias here because he thinks that uh, working at the bottom of the pyramid will improve the health of populations much more than working at the top of the pyramid. Now notice, that our stuff, what we're talking about, precision medicine and precision public, precision health is at the top of the pyramid, meaning that even if we do such a great job, it may or may not have the, the biggest impact on population health. I'd like to sort of take that idea and move forward because I don't necessarily completely agree with this pyramid. I have my own pyramid idea which uh, I want to unravel uh, slowly. But before we do that, I want to talk about causation and big data. Big data is, you know, it's big. We're all surrounded by it, okay? And I want to put it in the context of the nature-nurture debate because a lot of our public health, healthcare dichotomy comes down to this. And I, having lived in a public health agency for so long, people would tell me, well, forget genes. We can't change them. Uh, you know, nature versus nurture. And this is sort of data from uh, the recent nature genetics meta, meta, meta analysis of uh, thousands of uh, papers that essentially explored the heritability of a few things like height, weight, etc. And I don't know if you can read the small print, but at the end of the day, they discovered many of these traits are 50% genetic, 50% environmental. <laughs> okay, all right. So how are we better off knowing that it's uh, 50 of this, 50 of that? But the truth of the matter is it's, it's, that's not true. This is an analysis of variability or variance. Whereas the analysis of causation implies that everything is 100% genetic and 100% environmental. It's those interactions that we, we talk about. And just to drive the message home, last year when CDC published an MMWR article that showed that living in the southeast is bad for your health, uh, where, I, where I live, uh, basically showed that 
there is a gradient of preventable causes of death, and the Southeast has the worst record in terms of things that are related to tobacco, physical activity, etc. So the caption was, you know, lifespan more to do with geography than genetics. The paper didn't even talk about genetics. So I, I don't know why this, the jump on, uh, you know, uh, your zip code is more important than your genetic code. It may be true, but I reacted to it. I said zip code and genetic code are both important to your health. I mean, I, I refuse, I mean, this is the map of mortality. Uh, the southern belt and uh, whatever you want to call it, stroke, diabetes, cancer, everything. And, and uh, it may have something to do with uh, our access to care, our disparities, issues, but why put one, pit one versus the other? I mean, that analysis that the CDC did had nothing to do with genetics. It was just a geographic analysis of causes of death. So we don't have to do that. And this reminded me of the schism between medicine and public health. Uh, actually, this was not my idea. Kerr White, many years ago, wrote a book about the schism between medicine and public health, and he attributed that schism to the formation of schools of public health in, in the 20th century. So Stanford is not going down that path. <laughs> uh, so I, I, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not here to criticize one or another. I grew up at Johns Hopkins, where we have a strong school of public health, but you have to cross you have to cross the bridge between the hospital and the School of Public Health in order to do something. And this is what I found my way all day long, going back and forth across Wolf Street when I lived in Baltimore. So we are surrounded by big data. And in the context of causation, you know, we, we have to go beyond correlations. You can correlate things a lot, but cause-effect relationships do depend on the ability to intervene. Your friend Atul uh, <coughs> but, uh, who you know, is not here to defend himself, uh, said, and I quote, the scientific method itself is growing obsolete. And maybe he was misquoted, but the idea is that big data uh, is going to change everything. That in the old days, we used to have a hypothesis, and in the new day, now we just throw it in, all in a computer and come up with an answer. Now, my answer to this is yes, you, can, you come up with a new hypothesis, right? But you, you have to test it. So you, sometimes you need trials. More often than not, you need trials. So big data is helping the hypothesis generating machine. Uh, but at the end of the day, when Watson puts everything down in, you come up with the answer. And sometimes the answer is giggle, garbage in, garbage out. But we won't say that to IBM. Uh, just to get a little bit more on this idea of correlations and causations and ecological fallacies, there is a um, I think a website, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, spuritsassociations.com, uh, that correlates things that may have nothing to do with one another. For example, in this case, correlating the divorce rate in Maine with the per capita consumption of margarine. <laughs> a high degree of correlation. Doesn't make sense. But the second one actually makes sense. The total revenue generated by arcades uh, compared to the computer science doctors awarded. <laughs> there may be something there, but if you think this is a joke, you think this is a joke, uh, earlier this year, a big famous paper came out from our friend Bert Vogelstein that generated a lot of buzz, uh, which is sort of what causes cancer. And this is a science paper published early in the year correlating the lifetime risk of various cancers vis-a-vis -vis the total stem cell divisions. And it makes sense that the more stem cell divisions you have, the higher the likelihood of getting cancer. This is an ecological observation. You're taking a population level metric and vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, a number of uh, sort of stem cell division at the biological level. Now, does that mean one causes the other? They did some fancy math and they came up with two thirds of cancer maybe just due to bad luck. But I can tell you, if you're an individual who gets cancer, it's all bad luck because, I mean, why am I lucky? Even many smokers don't get lung cancer. But at the population level, uh, there are things we can do. We know genes, we know environment, we can reduce the burden of lung cancer by 90% if we all stop smoking. So this e ecological type analysis, which I think will be done more and more with big data, we have to be very careful with what to do with it. And I'm not, I mean, Bert Vogelstein and Tomaschetti had the right, I mean, they defended themselves, it's a solid paper, but 
the, the, uh, the, the media picked up on it as the bad luck hypothesis, and I would say it's the bad journalism hypothesis, but that's what <laughs> happens when you put uh, ecological observations together. An example of what you can do with uh, big data is sort of my own homegrown human genome epidemiology navigator, which is a, a database, curated database, that uh, CDC has been maintaining for the last 10 years plus, which has now more than 100,000 genetic epi articles. Now, you can say, why do you need a database? You can just do PubMed. And well, when you do PubMed, you come up with a lot of garbage. So what we did was apply uh, text learning, uh, text mining tools to find the literature to try to separate the genetic epi articles from the non-genetic epi article. And cut a long story short, I had a very bright bioinformatician who developed an algorithm that had very high sensitivity and specificity and to find what we wanted, he published a paper and then he left our office. In the meantime, the field changed. People moved from candidate genes and GWAS to whole genome sequencing. So the set of words that he used to find genetic epi articles, that there was a, the, the algorithm actually lost sensitivity and specificity. So I called him up earlier last year. I said, wait, you have to come back to our office. We need a makeover of this. So he came back and now he works with us. So basically, uh, this is non-causal. You're trying to correlate. And these support vector machines that uh, put together a large amount of words, uh, in this case, would, uh, would tell the story. But I was so excited, because I'm an epidemiologist. I'd like to predict uh, why some people get disease. So we have access to NHANES. And you mentioned NHANES. Uh, we know some of the risk factors for type 2 diabetes. And I said to Wei a few years ago, why don't we apply, uh, you know, trying to predict pre-diabetes and type, type 2 diabetes in the United States population uh, by throwing, putting in all the variables and enhance, and there are like 10,000 variables. So this is like a, a big machine learning enterprise. And we kind of knew what the answers were. were. I mean, you know, BMI and, and uh, you know, age and a few things. So I got lost in this. And he wrote this paper, which was proof of concept only. But if you don't know what the truth is, you're going to be lost. And you can say, well, we need replication. We need all of these things. It's fine. But just be aware of big data. And I think the, the major challenge is really reproducibility. And uh, before big data, uh, I mean, I used the slides multiple times before, you know, epidemiologists roll the dice. And one day, they discovered that coffee goes, causes depression, but only in twins. <laughs> but now we have many more input variables. And we have uh, depression maybe sub, you know, subcategorized according to molecular subtypes. So we have 10, 10 types of depressions. And we have not just twins and rats and uh, men between 25 and 40, but we have millions of genetic variants. So the long and short of it is that type 1 error is going to mushroom. And you know what the, uh, the answer of genetic community was? Oh, we'll reduce the p-value. I mean, now we, we deal with 10 to the minus 8. As a, as a good way to find the, the, the good stuff from the bad stuff. But this is just uh, words of caution. All right, next, next segment. So I come from public health that has an inherent suspicion of precision medicine. I love precision medicine. Big data is going to help it, but let's be, be aware of it. So how do we make stuff happen? So what I'm going to describe to you is a public health approach, at least the way I think of it. You know, we hear the word translation a lot. I, I, when I first started working at NCI uh, a few years ago, the, the word translation meant really that bench to bedside model. And this is where most of NIH still lives. And uh, this is um, uh, driven by when Genome Institute developed their strategic plan, uh, the new strategic plan in 2011, they wanted to fund more research that would accelerate the bench to bedside model. Uh, I looked at their strategic plan, I said, fine, but that will only get us to the bedside. What happens after that? I mean, will we actually reduce the burden of disease? So I wrote this uh, piece in the American Journal of Public Health, beyond base pairs to bedside. So what is that population perspective? How can we use it? So uh, just to be aware of it, uh, at the time, we were, um, for the past 15 years, I've been trying to join the words of population with genomics. And people at CDC would come to me and say, Wayne, this is an oxymoron. Genomics is a 
highly individual level stuff, whereas public health is all about the masses. And um, we had an international meeting in Bellagio 10 years ago that actually began to outline the intersection of population health with genomics. And this is a highly crafted de a definition. It took us two days and lots of wine and, and pasta in Bellagio <laughs> to come up with a definition of a multidisciplinary field, which is based on the population health sciences, concerned with effective and responsible translation of genome-based knowledge and technologies to improve population health. Each word means a lot. But what is public health anyway? Public health is what we need to do uh, to keep society and people healthy. People think about public health as working up epidemics, but I think of it as in this context of the three core functions, uh, assessing the health of populations, developing policies, and assuring that everyone gets the right services. This is a long story. I don't have much time for it. But the expanded translation highway, which I call it, has more than just bench to bedside. It uses uh, tools of knowledge integration, uh, meta-analysis and other things to uh, drive the, uh, the continuum from uh, something that reaches to, to the bedside to an evidence-based policy to in integration into program and then uh, improving population health. At each one of these steps and together, there are different sets of disciplines that come together, including economics, outcomes research, implementation science, clinical trials. It's a long story. Um, and we've been uh, at CDC doing this horizon scanning for years, uh, trying to figure out where are the low-hanging fruits in these applications. And when I discovered most of the action is in cancer, and this is uh, data from a paper we published last year, where the genetic applications, we uh, looked at them by type of application and the field, cancer is almost half or more of everything that's out there. That's why I spent so much time at NCI. So four principles for realizing the promise of genomics and big data. Use a strong epi foundation. We cannot do this without epidemiology. As a matter of fact, Kerr White, who wrote about the schism of, between medicine and public health, said the antidote to that schism is epidemiology. Go back to his paper. His book was published, I think, in the 80s. So we and others have been talking about genetic epi, but the way I talk about genetic epi is different than the gene hunters type genetic epidemiologists who are uh, analyzing pedigrees and populations. It's more about what do you do with a gene when you find one. This is, uh, I think this book needs uh, updating. And in my life at NCI, I've spent a lot of time uh, working with the uh, uh, outside community to try to uh, transform epidemiology to absorb this big data. And this is a big meeting which I can talk about for the next half an hour that we uh, sponsored at NCI that led to major recommendations for changing the field, including the training, including working in big data, including uh, uh, um, uh, empowering more cohort studies, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, feel free to look at that. And one of the, um, the things that's happening in, in the world of epidemiology is that the big data, both in terms of volume, variety, and velocity, is going to give us many more data points. And I think this uh, paper from Steve Mooney published earlier this year, his analysis was that most of the um, promise will be in that velocity where we, we can collect data in real time, look at, uh, at adherence to interventions and the potential to design more dynamic interventions than uh, you know, big data in terms of omics, neighborhood, et cetera. But we can dispute that, that analysis. So the second uh, big ticket item is knowledge integration, the center of, the, of uh, the enterprise. I wrote about it, but so many other people did. One of the most contemporary uh, knowledge integration process, which Stanford is involved with, with Carlos Bustamante and others, is ClinGen. ClinGen is a massive effort to curate the human genome, finding out what variants mean. This is a painfully slow process to figure out you know, what to return the results of genomic research and what do you tell people in terms of their risks and outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the third principle is use evidence-based medicine. Don't avoid it, like Atul did. Basically, it just we have to do the right trials when we have to do trials. So a couple of years ago, we convened all the groups that do evidence-based uh, recommendations in the genomic space, uh, and we wrote this paper 
which was based on the IOM report on guidelines we can trust. And we found out that in the space of genomics, many people are not using the IOM guidelines, but uh, more in terms of consensus. Our own homegrown effort at CDC has been the EGAP initiative for the last decade. EGAP stands for the Evaluation of Genomic Applications in Practice and Prevention. It's a big mouthful, but the idea is uh, similar to what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force did for many years, is developing a framework for evaluating uh, the, the, uh, the utility of genetic information, not just associations. And there is a difference in the methods to look at clinical validity versus clinical utility. Clinical validity is all about associations. Clinical utility is the balance of benefits and harms if you use something. And that, I think there is a lot of clinical validity stuff going on in genomics and big data, but not enough on the utility side, the so what of it. And as a uh, preliminary sort of uh, uh, tool, we developed this um, three-tiered classification of genomic applications in, uh, in the real world. Take a look at it, actually. It's on our website. There is a lot on that tier one. I don't have time to explain the, the case definitions, I know. Uh, but humor me a little bit. I have a few more. <laughs> yeah, we can cut down on the questions if you want. <laughs> But if I rush myself, I won't get to the bottom line. Um, so there's a lot in green. I'll give you some examples in the green. People ask me all the time, well, genomics is not ready for prime time. I tell them, no, there is a lot of stuff that if we do now, uh, we can improve population health. And in order, the fourth principle is use these population health disciplines. Use them because they all can work together from behavioral sciences to economics, et cetera. And this is a, a table from a paper we did a while back on uh, direct-to-consumer personal genetics. Uh, we invited all the 23 and me's and everybody else, and we wrote a paper together, which actually uh, the implementation of this kind of agenda, I mean, 23 and me now has a research arm. They're looking at uh, the behavioral outcomes of uh, uh, their testing, et cetera. We need to understand what people do with information, and that's a translational research agenda that we uh, we need to uh, apply. Hint, use implementation science. Uh, this sort of learning healthcare model that uh, was talked about earlier. Uh, there is a lot of stuff we don't understand in genomics and big data, and we will not understand until things are already in practice. And I wrote earlier this piece trying to um, um, maybe provoke NIH to do a little bit more than just uh, fund uh, this one million person cohort uh, to try to find new things, but actually use uh, the one million cohort to understand what we can do uh, to implement things that actually we know works. So, um, you know, there are countries that are less than a million people. So I think it's a unique opportunity for us to design a, uh, a study for discovery, but at the same time could be an arm for implementation. So I'm going to try to influence uh, how that uh, unfolds in the next few years. Just uh, a few examples of what I call these tier one genomic applications, which we wrote about. I know some of them are rare, but um, two cancers and one heart disease. Collectively, uh, most of these are autosomal, all of these are autosomal dominant conditions. And there are about two million people in the US that either have a BRCA, Lynch syndrome, or familial hypercholesterolemia. Most of them don't know they have it. So should we develop a population screening program? What we do, we do. So we had the strategic plan a few years ago and tried to uh, uh, figure out what to do with this. And uh, I think the one million person cohort is an ideal place to explore how to find 2% of the population that already have these rare genetic mutations that can benefit uh, from interventions. The one example I want to use today is Lynch. Lynch syndrome is a uh, a uh, three to five percent of all colorectal cancer is due to Lynch syndrome, uh, de defect and mismatch repair, and the EGAP working group uh, found out that in 2009 that uh, all uh, cases of colon cancer in the U.S., about 150,000, should be screened reflexively for Lynch syndrome. Why? Because if you can find a Lynch syndrome based on uh, tumor or um, uh, microsatellite instability, then you can uh, reach out to the relatives and then uh, start colonoscopies in your 20s rather than in 50s because you can reduce morbidity and mortality. So what happens? You bring people together, public health and healthcare. 
which we did a year afterwards, to see what can we do. Well, how can we use the cancer registries in every single state? All the new cases of colorectal cancer are registered, and they are submitted to a state uh, for registration. What can we do with that? So uh, people have been um, thinking about different ways to do that. So one, uh, uh, maybe an editorial that was a bit harsh, says population-based universal screening for Lynch syndrome, ready, set, how? <laughs> OK, so how do we do it? This is sort of where, uh, you know, maybe you can implement it uh, one, one place at a time or as a public health effort. And this is what we tried to do, is put together a Lynch syndrome screening network that has now more than 100 organizations around the US and around the world to actually implement this recommendation. So implementation science is hard work. Discovery is hard work, but, but we have to do both. So I want to wrap up with moving from precision medicine to precision public health. Forgive me, forgive me for going a bit over time. So um, precision med medicine and precision public health are two peas in a pod. What do I mean by that? You can't do one without the other. You've heard about the transition from medicine to health, but I want to make a transition from health to population health and put precision med medicine under that context. I want to talk about three areas that are ripe for uh, this population health effort. And it's really not just about genomics and not just about treatment. My friend Bill Riley, the director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, said that in one of his blogs. When I use uh, the concept of targeted uh, prevention, pathogen genomics, and then modernizing surveillance. So uh, our friend Eric Topol from down south has been uh, saying to us for many years, population medicine, let's get over it. Nobody is average. And I understand that fully. Nobody is average, but the question is what to do about it. That's my blog. I, I attended his meeting last year. I mean, he has this, uh, this uh, yearly event, uh, the future of genomic medicine. I gave this talk. Um, I said, nobody is average, but what do you do with it? You have to come up with recommendations that uh, fit the different needs of the distribution. One of them could be targeted screening, okay? So risk assessment, stratifying population to subgroups, and then what thresholds you use, et cetera. So one example of that is breast cancer. And breast cancer is, has many, many genetic variants now. Put aside the BRCA story, which is a high penetrant gene with very high um, uh, you know, lifetime risk. But look at the polygenetic distribution. There are lots of variants that if you put together, they can actually tell you the story. And this recent paper in JNCI actually told us the story based on, I think, 70 or 80 of these SNPs that uh, women have a different uh, risk of breast cancer based on with or without family history and based on the distribution of SNPs. So if, if you're thinking that there is an age cutoff for screening, which, by the way, that's changing every day. If you heard the American Cancer Society uh, recommendations the last week, then you can use a combination of polygenes and age to figure out where that cutoff is. So if you reach a certain absolute risk uh, for the next 10 years, maybe you can use that. So we had a meeting at the NCI not too long ago where we explored these discussions. And we didn't come up with an answer because we have to do trials that show that the progression uh, of cancer, I mean, you can model it, you can do all kinds of things, but at the end of the day, will there be more benefits and harms in, in doing this? And the whole controversy around screening is, is uh, just a case in point. A closer to home idea is the use of whole genome sequencing in bugs, pathogens, for controlling outbreaks, et cetera. This is CDC's uh, main gen genomic program right now which applies both to patient care and public health and outbreak detection, antibiotic use guidelines, and reducing the burden of disease. And I want to use the example of foodborne uh, diseases. We have many, many outbreaks every year in this country with uh, uh, foodborne outbreaks. Uh, the most uh, common of them are E. coli, Listeria, Salmonella, Vibrio, norovirus, et cetera. I don't know anyone in, probably in this room or elsewhere that has not been affected by uh, a foodborne disease at one point. And some of them can actually be severe or even fatal. So over the last two years, CDC has switched its approach from using pulse gel electrophoresis to whole genome sequencing. Uh, and this is lots of words in here, but the idea is 
uh, we collaborate, we uh, analyze all the cases and try to do sequencing to track these outbreaks. I just want to show you one graph uh, to see what happens before and after uh, sequencing. So the green is a sequencing. So there is a blue pre-sequencing era, 2012 to 13, the year one of sequencing and now year two of sequencing that we are able to detect more clusters, uh, number of outbreaks solved with the food source, and the number of cases linked to the food source is sort of where we are. I'm almost done. And uh, the last idea here is to uh, uh, do better populate, precision population health by doing better surveillance. So one do, way to do surveillance is just stratifying the outcomes. So the C registries uh, are well known. They've been tracking cancer incidence and mortality for many years. And in the last uh, report uh, to Congress, the annual report to the nation, for the first time they used molecularly target molecular subgroups of breast cancers, which are not based on genomics, but based on other things like triple negative, HER2, uh, hormone receptors, et cetera, to show the variability uh, based on molecular uh, subtyping. So I think we can do much more in the sequencing era. This is a, the la latest uh, uh, consensus classification of colorectal cancer based on immunology and and molecular genomics, uh, just published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, why do you want to stratify? Because cancer uh, may have different prognoses, may have different incidents, may have different etiological factors. So by knowing what's going on more precisely at the population level, this is precision surveillance, we will be able to understand what causes cancer better. And last but not least is my favorite here, from WGS to GPS. And, uh, <laughs> I want to read you this. Uh, our friend uh, John Quacken, Quackenbush at Harvard, bioinformatician, uh, said, he said last year that, hey, we've all known about Jon Snow and how he discovered and figured out the cholera outbreak based on the Broad Street pump in London. But John, re uh, John Snow really worked hard and worked for many, many months to track the trajectory of where people drank the water and related it to that pump. Whereas now, with the GPS, a few keystrokes, will be done with five minutes. This is big data in action. But, you know, in point of fact, in retrospect, it's easy to know because you, I mean, if you had analyzed the data that way, but which, you know, which GPS data do, do you want? So are there too many false positives? But I give it to him. This is the future. So the health impact pyramid for genomics, my reinvention of uh, Tom Frieden's pyramid. You know, at the lowest level, genomics and other technology can actually improve our health, our life, you know, using technology in agriculture, energy production, education, jobs, it has nothing to do immediately with health. But if we can use that technology to improve socioeconomic factors, that might eclipse anything we do on the precision medicine side. Context, LC, we have to deal with, protect, the, you know, develop the right policies for sharing, for autonomy, uh, for disparities and access, et cetera. This is very important, and I think we can't really reap the benefits of genomics and big data unless we work on the policy angle. We have got to develop some population-level interventions, like maybe a newborn screening-type program for adults, and this is where those three diseases that I mentioned uh, come in. And uh, the next step is those clinical interventions. I mean, yes, this is where precision medicine lies in, but it's in the continuum of activities that we can do. Now, the public education remains at the top, but after I drew this pyramid, I said, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense because this still implies that the top of the pyramid is less important, whereas the way I think of it is more like an onion where the middle of the circle is me or you. That's the top of the pyramid. And really, those uh, concentric circles of interactions require that public health and healthcare and policy and the environment work together driven by an empowered person who is after his or health care and improving their health. So in summary, uh, precision genomics and precision uh, medicine, public health, I think individual and population approaches are really complementary, not competitive, as uh, the world of public health now thinks. Causation and challenges of big data, it's complicated, what can I say? The public health approach, I gave you a four examples for what to do. And then with precision public health and precision po population health, 
that we have new tools that hopefully can lead to more precision population health. Thank you. Thank you.